Hi everyone, welcome to the Live Longer World podcast where I have conversations with scientists, entrepreneurs and other advocates that are transforming the field of longevity science and advancing the science behind slowing and reversing aging. If you are new here, my name is Aastha and I am the host of the Live Longer World podcast. I actually got started with a newsletter where I talk about basics of longevity science and longevity lifestyle hacks. I also inform readers of upcoming podcast releases there, so if you wish to stay informed, you will find the link to the newsletter in the description section below. Great. If you want to listen to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or any other medium you prefer, you will also find all the links in the show notes below. Now with that, let's get started with today's episode. My guest today is David Gobel, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Methuselah Foundation. Methuselah Foundation has donated several million dollars for the advancement of longevity research and regenerative medicine. Their goal is to make 90 the new 50 by 2030, and I'm sincerely rooting for that. So Dave was an entrepreneur before he decided to jump into the field of longevity. In my conversation with him, we discuss how he got excited about longevity research, companies that are funded by Methuselah, including Osin Biotechnologies, the concept of longevity escape velocity, his work with the Super Centenarian Research Foundation, how one can get involved in funding longevity companies, and more. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, Dave, and welcome to the Live Longer World Show. It's so good to have you here today. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. I am very much looking forward to it too. So I think before we get started uh, talking about your background in longevity and how you came about to start Methuselah, uh, you have a background in entrepreneurship. You started quite a few ventures. And I think one thing that was quite interesting to me was that you worked in the TSA. Uh, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about that experience. Is there anything in particular that you learned from that experience that stood out to you or any valuable insights? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, one of the things that uh, was very valuable at TSA was that it <clears throat> was a startup when I got there. A typical startup will have a couple of founders. This was a startup that had up to 65,000 people within nine months. That was an amazing experience. With that much growth, what you find is that there's a lot of room for opportunity because most people, let's face it, they'll wait for someone to tell them what to do. But as an entrepreneur, I saw it as an opportunity to help to define a space and therefore a job title and, you know, uh, activity that would be a high value. And so I put together a proposal to uh, the uh, TSA management, TSA innovative by design, as opposed to happenstance. And so there were like five pillars of innovation, one of which was to develop an idea management system to reduce the distance between the top leadership and the frontline operators. The frontline operators know what's wrong. They know what the opportunities are. But if you think of it, of a, a large organization, not just government, but any large organization, the uh, procedures are designed to be as predictable as possible, which rules out almost all innovation. So you, the bigger the organization, the more steps there are on the pyramid, and each step on the pyramid has a leader or manager whose job is essentially to say, no, now get back to work. So we put together an idea management system. It uh, was named uh, Idea Factory. And, um, you know, it came up with hundreds of innovations that cost almost nothing because it went straight from the operators 
if an operator had an idea, then other operators could vote it up. And if they thought it was a good idea, it would, you know, if it got a hundred upvotes, well, then management was uh, uh, committed to look at it and evaluate it and give an answer. And as a result, there was a tremendous rate of innovation, um, especially when it was new, because you can imagine that low hanging fruit is called low hanging because it's picked first. Yeah. So anyway, that was, that was one thing uh, that actually got developed, deployed and worked as designed. Another thing was um, venture capital. So you have uh, multi-billion dollar uh, technology budgets in uh, major government uh, agencies. Um, but sometimes a venture capital approach is also appropriate to try out because you could um, potentially get uh, powerful results for two orders of magnitude less investment. Uh, I became aware of this phenomenon in an earlier company that uh, I co-founded called Knowledge Adventure. We developed uh, amazing, this is, you know, all modesty aside, we developed amazing software for its time. So amazing, in fact, that uh, the United States uh, military came and said, how is it that you're able to develop and sell for $29.95 stuff that's gonna cost us $5 million mm -hmm. and we'll probably fail to deliver. And so, you know, I remembered that. And uh, so we uh, partnered with uh, the intelligence community's uh, venture capital operation in QTEL. And uh, later Department of Homeland Security came in as well. They followed our lead in and we developed uh, well, just for an example, the world's first honest to God tricorder. It exists. Uh, there's a company called 908devices.com. And we uh, at TSA and several other of the partners who wanted a full mass spectrometer that was handheld, lab quality, wireless, battery powered, non contact, it exists. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that one. So that, yeah. that's an example of um, a couple of the things that we did at TSA. There's more. Uh, I, mm. I hate being stuck in an office. And when I first went with TSA, uh, teleworking was not allowed because it was viewed as a uh, benefit, an employee mm. benefit with time we put together a proposal saying, no, it's not an employee benefit. It's a risk management tool. If you look at what is a target? Well, a target is a concentration of resources that's more expensive than the weapon you use to destroy it. Otherwise, you're just gonna run out of money trying to pick things off here and there. So uh, we came up with the idea of virtual continuity of operations. Rather than hiding under mountains, let's just become holographic. We're everywhere and nowhere in particular. That's the whole idea of what, or one of the benefits of the internet. And so we went from no one's allowed to telework to, of course, we want you to telework. That's good. I mean, it's the whole remote work situation right now, which I think is wonderful for the world. So. So do I. Yeah. yeah, less less carbon in the atmosphere. It's like it's good all over the place. Families get to go be together. It's all good. Exactly. And I mean, smart, smart people from all over the world, they can work for whichever company, uh, which is awesome. And I totally agree with you on the startup innovation point too. I worked for some big companies and now some startups and it's just such a different structure in terms of idea generation and being nimble. I think a lot of companies could benefit from having that startup mindset and uh, way of working. Yeah, the way of thinking, the way we think of it at the foundation is we, uh, we're a jazz band. 
we have our theme make 90 the new 50 by 2030 mm -hmm. no one's ever done it before so there's no symphony score to follow yeah so we have a theme and then things happen we look to see if the audience is saying yeah we like that and we look at each other hey is this working <laughs> <laughs> and That's so a great we, analogy. we can cycle very quickly. Yeah. Uh, fail fast and furiously, and then feed what succeeds. Mm -hmm. Just keep iterating. Yes. All right. So shifting gears to longevity, then, how did you get interested in the field, and what prompted you to start Methuselah? And I think. Along with that, if you could uh, speak a few words about it too and explain to people what the foundation and the fund is about. Okay, uh, let's start with the fund. The fund is a micro venture capital activity. It's an incubator fund. It's now fully invested. Um, and out of that came, uh, I think we're up to a, a 10 or 11 companies, all of which continue to exist and are prospering. Last week, we had an exit announcement where Volumetric Bio uh, is being acquired by 3D Systems. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And it's being uh, co-capitalized by United Therapeutics, all in pursuit of our mission to make new parts for people. And that's the goal there. So the fund is a for-profit that is a subsidiary of our nonprofit, the Methuselah Foundation. Mm -hmm. So M Fund is one methodology that we use to get things um, out of people's heads or out of university labs and into and uh, translated into something that can actually help people. So the foundation started by uh, issuing a prize, the Methuselah Mouse Prize. The idea at that time was that there was no industry. So it was honestly snake oil. Uh, nobody had any idea what would really work. And, and so, how people uh, when it started, just so there's an idea of oh, when there was no uh, industry. So I started thinking about it in 1999 as, as a kind of a hobby, deep dive research hobby. And then in 2000, um, a close friend got leukemia. And I began to think about the experience that they went through with the medical industrial complex where everyone successfully followed the rules. But the rules ended up with the person being dead unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, the term of art for that these days is moral injury. The practitioner knows that by following the rules, they're harming patients. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're following the rules, but they're, uh, they have a lesser form of PTSD that accumulates. So actually, I kind of ran into that. I really felt like there was something that could be done and I wasn't doing anything. So I looked in the mirror, I felt kind of ashamed of myself, like I should do something. Why? Because I can, that's why. And because what's happening is bad, that's why. You don't really need anybody to give you permission to do a good thing, although, there's lots of folks who suffer from doing good. Mm -hmm. It's not, not free. Doing right is easy. Good is dangerous. But I digress. Okay. So at that point, I decided I, I would try to figure out what was the best way to get the biggest bang per buck or for effort on um, uh, reorienting the goal and incentive structure of medicine writ large. And it, it, it turned out after doing the research that many, if not most, uh, childhood mortality 
had been tamped down as much as possible. Maternal uh, mortality had also gone down dramatically. So the, you know, the three big diseases, cardiovascular, uh, neurological, and cancer, mm -hmm. they were all associated with something. And what was that something? Being over the age of 40. And then there was an exponential curve where it just kept going up and up and your, your odds get worse and worse. And what's underneath all of that? What's the, uh, the driver age? So I decided, huh, let's work on that. Well, what do you do? It's an enormous problem. Well, the first thing we did was, and this is when I was with uh, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, de Grey at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, found him uh, via a Usenet conversation in the early days of the internet. Is that, was, that, I, was that a previous social network? You guys oh yeah, about? there were no social networks. <laughs> Usenet. I guess like a chat service. <laughs> yeah, like an internet relay chat. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I had been kind of, you know, I, I didn't have a PhD in anything. So I was just a guy who had an idea but I knew that I would need a partner to help me with the science side. And eventually uh, there was an email that uh, was from a very uh, well-reasoned person. And so I reached out and it turned out to be Aubrey. We made common cause. And I said, I wanted to do a prize. Why do you want to do a prize? Because you don't have to pay anything until it's won. And you don't have, really have to even do much until it's won. You just uh -huh. have to be really clever with the rules. So we started the Methuselah Mouse Prize to move the scientific community away from the certainty of losing their careers if they pursued extending the healthy human lifespan. At that time, if you said out loud, that's what you wanted to do, mm -hmm you wouldn't get any more funding. People were terrified of saying that out loud. But once we had the Methuselah Mouse Prize out there, and after it had been won four times, it became obvious, not only can you do it, but you can do it lots of different ways. You can extend maximum mouse lifespan for at least four different ways. So of course we can do this. And the, the field, the academic field switched to and we should mm -hmm. do this. So that was, I guess you could say the foundation's first win. And then from there, we have gone from um, issuing grants, like we uh, gave a grant to Yao Pedro Megalis and his lab to do the fully annotated sequencing of the bowhead whale and later the capuchin monkey. That's now in the public domain, so he did a great job and it cost almost nothing on the grander scheme of things. Mm -hmm. uh, we've we've co-launched, I guess you could say, uh, four or five also nonprofits focused in this area, different aspects, Oregon Preservation Alliance, SENS, uh, Super Centenarian Research Foundation, which I'm very proud to say achieved its mission and ceased operations. Why should foundations live forever? People mm -hmm. should live long, not foundations. Um, anyway, I'm rambling on. No, yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, I'm very curious to hear about the Super Centenary Foundation, so we'll come back to that. But there are two points that I, I do wanna to touch upon uh, that you mentioned. One was that you decided there should be a reorientation of the healthcare system which I think you're getting at the fact that the healthcare system is all about fixing diseases as opposed to preventing these diseases. And that's a huge thing where we know there's, there's so much research coming out that we can probably pre prevent a lot of diseases, but the incentives are all misaligned and it's all about fixing them by which point the damage is done. And it's quite hard. I mean, it, it's not impossible to cure, but the odds of curing obviously go down. And then the other point you mentioned was 
what is the biggest factor for these big three diseases, cardiovascular, cancer, um, and it's the above being above the age of 40, which I, I, I can't stop harping on that point because it just it's so obvious to see that, you know, aging becomes this meta disease, like everything you say where, you know, it's not smoking, that's the biggest risk factor for lung cancer, it is age. And I, I, I think it is important for people to start understanding that. And also knowing that, you know, there are scientists, um, entrepreneurs, investors, everyone working on trying to fix this. And it's not, it's probably, hopefully not impossible. And we can um, achieve at least better health span as we age too. So um, yeah, and I, I, I know that's the, the mission of your foundation. So um, we can jump into that where you talk about the mission being making 50 the, or making 90 the new 50 by 2030. Um, yes. I guess, why is that the mission versus something like living to 120, 150, 200? Yeah. Okay, there's the, the key to it is the end date. Most foundations say we want to cure, fill in the blank, cancer, heart disease, uh, poverty, um, but they never make it a falsifiable mission. Mm -hmm. When you think about a 100 meter dash at the Olympics, how far do you have to run? 100 meters? <laughs> Everybody knows it, and they right. know whether to cross the finish line or not. Right. We have laid down a marker that's falsifiable. We're saying we're going to make 90 the new 50 by the year 2030, mm -hmm. and it informs, guides everything we do. That keeps so us from why getting... why the year 2030 then, and uh -huh. yes how do you measure that 90 would be the new 50? So you asked two questions. Mm -hmm. I'll answer them one at a time. So there's um, one, one of the key things in uh, communication is giving people permission to believe. As far as we know, in the modern era, only one person has reached 120 years old. Mm -hmm. One out of, uh, let's say, in the case of uh, three generations worth of human beings, one out of maybe 15 to 20 billion people. Mm -hmm. So if we say our mission is to make uh, 120 the new 50 by 2030, I don't even believe it. Fair. Could we do it by 2060? I don't know, maybe, but I'll be dead by then. And everyone I know will be dead by then. So it's not relevant. If it's not relevant, why would anyone donate money to help? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't, it wouldn't be rational. 2030. I'm probably going to make it to 2030. And how would I like to feel? Uh, I happen to be almost 69. So by 2030, you can do the math. I'm going to be old from the standpoint of someone who was born in 1952. I don't feel old today. I mean, I do not look 50 anymore. So um, what would people like? They would like to not be in pain, suffering, maybe being in a nursing home, not being able to control their own bowel functions, <laughs> basically going back to being a baby, but remembering mm -hmm. if you still have your marbles, what it was like to be healthy. That's not an outcome anybody wants. So everybody reaches that in the last say two years of their life and no one knows exactly when that will happen on an individual happen on an individual basis but when you get there you your eyes open and you go horror movies have nothing on this <laughs> a very very wise wonderful mentor and friend 
of myself and my family passed away about uh, four months ago. The last two weeks of his life were awful and completely, in my opinion, undeserved. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, the man only did good in his life. So it would be nice to, if not end it, at least significantly delay it. I agree. I think um, for most people, it's about, you know, it's about being healthy, even when they're older. When I ask some people, do you want to live to be 120, 150? Actually, most of them say no, which is uh, maybe it's about 50, 50, but which, which is surprising to me. But I get it. They say that, well, if I can be healthy in my 80, 90, I take that. But I'm fine with dying, dying at that age. And I was like, that, that's a fair point. Like, who doesn't want to be healthy is every time, right? So that's the answer to your question, why 90? Mm -hmm. Because it's believable. People can yeah. imagine making it to 90. Mm -hmm. They can imagine that 50 is a whole lot better than 90. So it's something that they can plausibly get behind without being laughed out of the room or told that's ridiculous or it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So we set ourselves that mission and um, everything we do, as I mentioned before, is focused on achieving that by 2030. Well, what if all we've achieved is making 75 of the new 50 by 2030. Oh, well, that's still really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who would turn that down? Totally agree. So you've already funded some companies, some, some um, projects, and some of them being in the tissue engineering space. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't you give some examples of companies you've funded and some of the work okay. they're doing in the agent space? Sure. Uh, Turn Bio is one of the companies. Um, they're doing extremely well. They are the inventor of epigenetic reprogramming. They're out of Stanford, uh, uh, two profs and a postgrad, who um, developed a cocktail to reverse epigenetic aging and thus the cell's uh, age, functional age. Mm -hmm. um, and they were able to do that on an ex vivo basis. And then when they reimplanted the uh, multiplied cells into a mouse model, the mouse healed and had the same functional level as a young mouse. That sounds like a good thing. Mm -hmm. Younger cells leads to a younger phenotype. Absolutely. So, so we invested in them uh, maybe three years ago, I think it was. Um, and they're doing really, really well. And the epigenetic reprogramming space has been growing. So we, uh, our, our thesis is the more people taking shots on goal, the better for our mission. So we, we're we delighted that Turn Bio is doing extremely well as a business. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, but it's, it's wonderful that there are others who are involved as well because that makes the whole space more investable with investment, more progress, more progress, more translation to the clinic, shampoo, rinse, repeat. You have a, a solution that comes before 2030. Then we have Volumetric Bio, which was just acquired by 3D Systems. Uh, they make, in my opinion, the world's, by far the world's best uh, 3D tissue printing system that is um, viable for production level of uh, development. Uh, we have, uh, we, we founded, not, no, that's not true. We were the, one of the founding investors in Organovo, the first 3D tissue printing company. And today um, they're focused on uh, using tissue models to find drug targets, not animal models. 
3D mm -hmm. human models, which are vastly more effective. Right. We invented in Viscient Bio, which is using the same uh, Organovo technology under license to develop additional drugs, all focused on solving uh, uh, diseases that result from aging and reversing the effects of the disease. Oh, let's see, Leucadia Therapeutics. Uh, had the, uh, the founder, Doug Athel, his theory was um, we've been spending the last 30 years trying to clean the brain of uh, A-beta and tau tangles, and we've spent uh, 25 to $30 billion uh, and wasted every dime of it because we still have no solutions. And everybody keeps following that. It's like the Indians would uh, stampede buffalo over the cliff. Well, why do the buffalo keep running over the cliff? <laughs> um. <laughs> We're not that much different than buffalo, it turns out. <laughs> We're all stampeding in the same direction. Well, he, he said, nope, I'm going to start over. I don't want to waste my life mm -hmm. going in, in a useless direction. So he went back to first principles, which is always a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. and asked about where does Alzheimer's start and what are its early symptoms? Well, one symptom was a loss of a sense of smell. And the etiology of Alzheimer's is that it begins, if you think of it as a fire, the fire begins or is sparked just above the olfactory bulbs, which is where you smell, your sense of smell. So mm -hmm. he said, wow. And that's interesting. So he began to, uh, he, he further investigated and began to focus on a thing called the cribriform plate, which is a mixture of bone, meat, vessels, nerves uh, with uh, pathways, actual holes in the bone. It's, it's a lot like a lava rock in consistency. That sits where in the nose? If you get shot between the eyes, right. that's where the cribriform plate is. I see. So um, anyway, his hypothesis in, uh, uh, let's see, when was it? I eh, can't remember, 2016 maybe. No, he put out a paper in 2013. And I heard him give a presentation on the paper in 2015 on the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Was basically that the plumbing plumbing was clogged. Hmm. The cerebral spinal fluid, when it goes through your brain, is constantly cleaning your brain from the inside out. Mm -hmm. and it goes toward the back, down the spinal column into the lymphatic system. So it mm -hmm. goes from lymphatic to lymphatic and gets cleaned up out of the brain. But the prefrontal areas of the brain, the front goes through the cribriform plate. And the theory was simply, well, if the toilet is clogged, it doesn't matter if you try to clean the toilet, you have to unclog the toilet. Sorry. So then we uh, took a look at um, cadaver um, cribriform plates and com without knowing what cause of death was, we graded them on a scale of most closed or mm -hmm. occluded to least closed or occluded. After rank stacking them, we then opened the database of cause of death. It was, I think, Veterans Administration. And it turns out that the correlation coefficient was almost perfect. The more clogged, the more they died from Alzheimer's. The less clogged, the more they died of something else. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a really wonderful signal, but correlation is not necessarily causation. Right. So then we, the Methuselah Foundation funded a trial to uh, use ferrets, which have a very, very high speed uh, near-term memory system. They go into dark tunnels looking for food, other animals. They've never been in the tunnel before. They follow their nose to find the prey. 
And then when they've got the prey, there's nothing their nose can do for them. They have to use inertial guidance, reverse the guidance to figure out how to get out of a tunnel they've never been in before, which by the way is completely dark. Mm -hmm. So Doug had this brilliant idea of using ferrets as a uh, test animal. And so he did surgery on the control, uh, not on the, yeah, a mock surgery on the controls and then actual surgery on the test uh, branch of the experiment to partially close their cribriform plates. And the result of the study is that over time, gradually, the uh, treated population, their behavior began to change. They lost their fear. Uh, they became more unpredictable. They couldn't find their way out of a paper bag, much less the mock tunnels that Doug had put together. Hmm. So that's a real signal. We didn't totally occlude them. We partially occluded them, which uh, was more relevant to the human condition where with time, the uh, cribriform plate becomes calcified and the openings close up. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a lot of time on this, but um, it's an example of the risk that a foundation like ourselves can take in you know, when I, when I first heard the idea, I said, you know, maybe this has a 0.5% chance of being right. But I already know one thing. We've already spent 25 to $30 billion in a quarter century finding out what doesn't work. Right. So that's an enormous advantage as if we had invested that. Well, we didn't have to invest that. Yeah. So now I would say our, our probabilities of having been sufficiently right to be able to come up with a therapy are vastly higher than half a percent. Um, I'm kind of afraid to give a percentage because the SEC will put out a contract on me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I, I agree that I think some of these um, longevity companies, I mean, because they're so high risk or just biotech in general, you need some more foundations actually donating and um, funding these projects. But it's nice that you have the fund as well for those who are actually looking for equity and, and investments and profitability. Um, so so moving I just, I'd just mm -hmm. like to quickly say mm -hmm. that our donors and donor investors are the one who, ones who have made this all possible. So when, when we're successful, not if, um, <laughs> the names of those people are on a monument in St. Thomas, because they deserve to be remembered for a long 100%. time. For sure. Yeah. yeah. That's what we call the 300 monument. And for <laughs> those who have made a, a long term commitment, um, you know, they're, they're there. That's good. Um, the question on the fund, though so say you want to enter the space as an investor, say it's just angel investing, investing in some of these startups, whatever little capital you can put on. What advice would you give for someone who wants to get started or how to even think about investments in the space um, and in general getting started to uh, invest in the longevity space? Well, uh, the way that the investment world is uh, structured, at least up until now, is that uh, it's in private companies, it's oriented toward high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. So I'll speak to that group yeah. uh, for now. Uh, for the other group, it's uh, public companies is probably the only practical way to, to deal with it. Right. So, so for, let's call it angel investors, uh, probably mm -hmm. the best thing to do would be to, to look at our portfolio and to understand the themes that we follow and to see if you like that approach. Mm -hmm. Our approach seems very simplistic. We, we set for ourselves certain uh, notions that um, guide our thinking. So new parts for people. That seems fairly simplistic and obvious. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But you have to start there in order to have an idea of what answers the questions that devolve from new parts for people. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, we have uh, we partnered with NASA to do a vascular tissue challenge that came out of the original idea of, well, we want new parts for people. How do we get there? Can we, you quickly explain to people what the vascular tissue challenge is? Oh, yes. Uh, when, we, when we helped uh, get Organovo get started, mm -hmm. as a consequence of that experience, we found out that you couldn't scale tissues up in thickness beyond about 20 cells thick because you couldn't easily or at all recapitulate microvasculature, venules, mm -hmm. capillaries. So that was a rate limiter. It's kind of like a, you know, a sound barrier in aeronautics. And so we proposed a, a prize challenge to NASA to lift this limit. And we proposed that in 2013 and they said yes in 2016. And we announced it in 2016 and it was won earlier this year. It went a little bit longer because of the pandemic. We had to delay things, but two teams won. Now that limit no longer exists. So in order to get new parts for people, we walk the walk and realize, okay, here's a barrier. We need to break this barrier. How do mm -hmm. we break this barrier? So the vascular tissue challenge having been won, we've broken that barrier. Now people are talking very credibly, believably about replacement engineered human tissue made mm -hmm. from your own cells, liver, kidney, lung, maybe pancreas. Heart will probably be the most difficult because it's biomechanical, electric. It's an amazing and therefore difficult organ to engineer, but we'll get there too. I, I recently had Dr. John Eber on the podcast. He's a professor at um, Albert Einstein Medical College and that's his, uh, his lab is also working on this, uh, replacing all the parts of the body, and especially with a focus on the neocortex, because the brain is obviously, a, along with the heart, it seems like one of the most complex ones to replace. Well, it's the most complex machine in, in the material universe. Exactly. <laughs> we know of. But that's a good, 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 good point, Dad. Great. Um, I think just a couple of quick last questions. You came up with the idea of uh, longevity escape velocity. What does that mean? Um, when you, when you um, are able to uh, reverse aging one year in a year, this, you essentially have stopped aging. That's pretty much it. If the rate of aging is one year and every year you can roll it back a year, mm -hmm. you're not aging. Now, what most people would like is to not age at all on any day, mm -hmm. but it turns, it turns out that what's probably more plausible is that every quarter or every six months, you would go in for an oil change. <laughs> and then you know, maybe every uh, two to three years, you'd go in for a major overhaul. Mm -hmm. and that would be at the beginning of the process, the historical uh, uh, unfolding of this uh, phenomenon mm -hmm. of extending longevity, healthy longevity. Not too far down the road, you'll get to a point where the body is more deterministically understood and understood as an information system. And information is editable. And so you could divine, design systems that would, you know, be 
have have higher abilities to repair in real time to maintain ongoing fidelity to a uh, body image. Mm -hmm. People typically think of their optimal age as somewhere between 26 and 35. I, I tend to want to, um, yeah, I guess 30 would be good. <laughs> yeah. Did I answer um, the question? Yes, yes, you did. I mean, it's like if you're saying if you can reverse aging by one year at a time, you're essentially ending yeah. aging. But yep. yeah, I, 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 I hope so. I, I certainly, I, I mean, I agree with that. I, I hope we can do it. Well, what we're doing already is in people who are generally healthy, we're slowing it. Exactly. We're slow. When, by the time, when I was uh, a little boy, anybody who was in their 60s was old. I right. mean old. Right. When Otto von Bismarck of Prussia, who was trying to create Germany, thought of a way to get people to depend on the government, his way was to offer the original social security system. Mm -hmm. And it paid out when you made it to 65. I don't know the exact number, but the idea was that it would be financially viable because 90 about 99% of everybody would be dead by then. Right. Now, Almost everybody makes it to 65, yeah. you know, they die on a uh, motorcycle. <laughs> um, and so, you know, aging has been slowed. We really couldn't uh, describe at a molecular la level what we've actually done. We don't even know. Mm -hmm. You can see the result. It happened. It's happening. Yeah. yeah. So the goal of the foundation is essentially, let's speed that up. Instead of it being uh, maybe a quarter year of longevity extension every 10 years, let's make it one year, every one year. Shampoo, rinse, repeat. See what that happens. Would, that would certainly be remarkable. On mm -hmm. that point, uh, what do you think are some of the challenges that the industry still faces? I know funding is something that people talk about. Um, or maybe what, what do you think could be improved in the field in general? Oh, there are almost everybody comes to money. Mm -hmm. And uh, my feeling is that money comes to winning solutions and ideas. There are at the beginning, there wasn't anybody looking to invest in this space. Mm -hmm. Well, now there are very large numbers of people with real money who are yeah. looking to invest in the space. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd say the, the biggest issue is having a breakthrough idea um, with um, you know, co-founders who have levels of credibility sufficient to interest investors. Also, what I would say is it would be, it's what we look for as a platform uh, rather than a single point solution. Uh, so uh, for instance, Oshin uh, Bio uh, is a senolytic company, mm -hmm. removing senescent cells uh, selectively. Mm -hmm. Well, since that's a platform approach, we were able to spin out a company called Oncocenics, which is focused on eliminating cancer cells without using chemotherapy. Just find them and shoot them <laughs> and leave all the other cells alone. Chemotherapy is like a gas attack, a mustard gas attack, which is yeah. actually where it came from, where if you happen to be in the wrong neighborhood, it doesn't matter whether you're a combatant or not. So that's what happens to all your cells. Um, if you get cancer and then chemotherapy and radiation are used on you, it accelerates your aging at best. So that's what having a platform allows for. You mm -hmm. can spin out companies or you can uh, use um, 
an end point that the FDA will uh, agree to. Whereas if you have a single shot on goal, then that's not a risk management approach that we, we want. The other thing we look for is, are you fundable outside of Methuselah Foundation's uh, support? Mm -hmm. is, is it conceivable that it's fundable within 18 to 24 months by others? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I've seen lots of instances where an angel will get involved with a biotech idea and company, therefore, where they just, it's just an, a voracious cash hole and you can go bankrupt as an investor. Right. It needs syndication. And it, it's not just about the money, it's about the mines and the network connections that come from lo lots of high quality investors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then this is from our point of view, uh, that is that um, you have a signal impact on the problem will not we won't invest if it doesn't contribute to our mission which means if, if you come to us with a small molecule today and say we would like to use this small molecule what i have to say to myself is well i've got eight years left before 2030 will mm -hmm. i get through the full panoply of research development clinical uh uh, uh FDA gauntlet, but, I won't. So yeah. I can't invest. It won't. Others, I'm, others are welcome to invest, but I can't. I have to do things that can be achieved and relevant and operational within eight years from today. That's fair. Good. Well, thanks for explaining that. Um, I think last question I want to leave you with is not related to longevity. I think you mentioned somewhere about, um, I had this quote somewhere, about money being um, being the driver of us, the human society not trusting each other. It's basically like a psychotic state. Uh, curious to hear your thoughts on that because I, I guess like how would capitalism and innovation work with that money? Well, it's all about, um, do we use money or does money use us? Right? That's fair. Yep. So, so I had a, uh, a question I needed to ask myself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this year, after 40 years of wanting to install solar panels, we finally installed solar panels. Mm -hmm. And in the process of installing solar panels, we decided that we would replace the roof uh, shingles underneath the panel. Okay. So we did it as a, as a result of installing solar panels. Now, if you look at the tax credit, you could argue that it's part of the solar system because you wouldn't have replaced it if you weren't installing solar. Mm -hmm. If you look at the opinions, the opinions vary. Should you take the credit for the roof repair or not? Mm -hmm. I chose not to because of the sense of how much is integrity actually worth? Is it worth 300 bucks? That would have been the credit. And I'm not yeah. sure you can put a monetary value to that. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. Is money the highest good? Most people will say no, but then how do they act? What is their behavior in the moment? Mm -hmm. It's challenging, isn't it? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a question humanity is going to have to deal with at some point or another. Imagine people who are 120 years old and they own everything. That, that would not be necessarily a good situation. We're seeing sort of the beginnings of that now. Mm -hmm. Well, a very high concentration of wealth. So, you know, that's above my pay grade, but I'm mindful of it personally. That's yeah. why I started a nonprofit rather than a company. I didn't want to have um, confusion as to the goals. Let's see, Dave, are you going to try to be rich or extend the healthy human lifespan? Because you can't do both. 
pick one. So no, I certainly, I think um, longevity will bring with it a lot of just social, philosophical, moral discussions, uh, but that's for another day. <laughs> yeah, so I think of money as freeze-dried coercion. Why else would anyone get up at four in the morning before the sun has even woken up? <laughs> go to a place that they don't want to go to and be told to do things they'd rather not do and then yeah. come home dead tired and still have email. At, why are you doing that? Why in the world are you doing that? Yeah. I'll never forget the day I decided to cancel my order for a Porsche in the mid 80s because I realized I was only buying the Porsche because I hated my job and I wanted something to make me happy. <laughs> but it would have put me into debt. Exactly. Not a smart idea at all. Right. <laughs> so anyway, that's one yeah. of the values of longevity is you get to live long enough to figure out all the things you're screwing up in your life and stop <laughs> doing it. <laughs> I agree. I'm optimistic there are good things to come. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if you, unless you have any last thoughts to add, uh, it's been a pleasure, Dave. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That's that. I hope that you have a good day. And I hope your thank listeners you. uh, enjoy our conversation. I, I certainly hope so too. Thank you so right. much. Sure. Bye bye. Bye. Hi everyone, if you enjoyed today's episode and learned from it, I would love it if you could subscribe to the channel and like the video. It helps get the word out. Additionally, it would mean a lot if you could show some support and share the channel with your friends and family. I want to get the word out on aging and longevity science to as many people as possible, such that we can all be healthier for longer. Okay, if you enjoyed this content on longevity science and science-backed health optimization and longevity lifestyle hacks, you can check out my newsletter, which is livelongerworld.substack.com. You can also listen to the audio version of this podcast on Spotify or other places that you get your podcast if that's the preferred medium. You will find all these resources on my website, which is livelongerworld.com. All right, I do have social media as well. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, I am at Live Longer World. Instagram, I am at Longevity Future, where I often post graphics distilling the basics of longevity science and also talking about longevity lifestyle hacks that I personally practice. Um, lastly, you can support my work by donating on Patreon, which is simply patreon.com forward slash Live Longer World. All of this is also included in the show notes, so if you want, check that out. And that's it for now. Stay in good health, and I will catch you next time.